be invited to talk. I'm very honored and pleased to uh, introduce Eva Tardo, a very prestigious researcher in algorithms. Uh, she has received very important prizes, the Fulkerson Prize, the Dancing Prize. And uh, she was the editor in chief of the Science Journal of Computing. Her books are very well known. Uh, the uh, algorithmics uh, book is a, has become a standard textbook for the most uh, introductory algorithm courses all over the world. Their networking book is very beautiful also. So uh, lately uh, she she has been working on algorithmic game theory and we are very pleased to have her in Mexico and in the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk and uh, your interest. So I put a lot of different words in the title, and I guess to start with, um, I want to talk about game theory and games, but they're going to be sort of combinatorial or discrete games mostly. Um, so let me introduce learning and the price of energy in a second and just uh, start with the game side and maybe start with how I think about games. So games is the outcome of selfish interest and the classical um, game theory par or, or example that I like thinking of as a start is, a is what's called the tragedy of the commons and the story goes that apparently in Bonn there was a common low gra grass patch way back, I don't know when and probably this is never true but whatever, some town, there's a grass patch when everyone who was a resident of the town was allowed to grass his or her calves. And this is a typical example of a game theoretic setup, at least the assumption is the, the members of the town are not are interested in having well-fed cows that milk, that produce milk. Um, they're not want to hurt, they like the other members of the town, they don't particularly want, want to hurt other people, they just want to have enough milk for themselves. So that's sort of what the selfish interest is. Um, the trouble in the example is that if you are one of these town members, and imagine this is a really big town, um, you're probably better off if you put yet another cow on that grass patch. Like instead of one cow, you could have two cows, or instead of two cows, you can have three cows. Um, then that way you get more milk, there one more cow. Yes, the grass patch will get a little bit worse because there are too many cows there, but one plus or minus won't matter so much. And so everyone can put extra cows and what really happens is the grass patch gets so bad that all the cows get scorny or die or don't produce milk. Uh, this is called the tragedy of the commons and if you want to think about it in mathematical terms, which is indeed what I want to do, I'm going to want to think of a model of a value of a cow on this gas patch. It's a decreasing function of the congestion. The more cows there are, the less milk that any single cow produces. And then your interest is, you know, the, the milk in, produced by your cow. That's the selfish interest. If there are too many cows, then the value of the cast patch went down very radically, and you can write up any set of functions you want here, and indeed you re realize that social welfare, that is the happiness of everyone in the town, would have been better off if they all restricted how many cows they put on. But selfishly, you seem like you're better off if you increase your cows. If you don't like cows and cow patches, in fact, I also like better examples where this tragedy doesn't happen and where the outcome is not so drastically bad. And the first example I'm going to spend a little bit of time on is, uh, is a rotting example. In this example, very similar to the cast, there's a, they're, rat, they're roads and you're, in this example, should imagine you're ra driving a car or you're sending a packet across the internet. And just like in the car case, your packet or your car is less well off, there are too many other cars over there. So there is a congestion problem. If there are too many cars in the road, it gets pretty slow. Um, so your interest is to try to you know, drive on paths that are shorter. Uh, unlike in a car example, I'm not going to assume that you want to have an extra car, you just want one car. And I'm going to give you an a, a objective function, you just want to get your car as fast as a destination as possible. And as we'll see, um, this will turn out not to have a tragedy or at least have a lesser tragedy, let's put it that way. So generally I'm going to interested 
inter going to be interested in the contrast between the CAR example or the tragedy of the commons example where social welfare is ruined by selfish behavior versus setups where selfish behavior might take you away from the what's called socially optimal solution, but not drastically so. So this is what I'm going to ask, how the quality of selfish outcome we have seen in the tragedy of commons, or if you want in a prisoner dilemma, is that, that, tra that selfishness can cost you arbitrarily high in social welfare. Every single m member of this little town would be better off if they restrained themselves to one cow. The thing is, I'm helping myself by putting an extra cow on and hurting all of the rest of you a teeny bit. Teeny bit, doesn't matter much, but if we all do it, that's an awful lot. That's sort of the story here. Um, so we're going to want to compare the, what the, the socially designed optimum and the selfish outcome is, and I have put both of these terms in quotation marks, suggesting I will define them in a second. Um, so to give you an outline of what I'm planning to do, I want to use the, the routing example as an example to introduce both the price of energy concept and maybe actually what it means to be a selfish outcome. I do this because um, the selfish outcome is a very nice, or the traffic routing is a very beautiful example of where an, uh, uh, the selfish outcome, what's usually called Nash equilibrium, is very nicely connected to convex optimization and hence feel, feels very comfortable for most people. Anything I say right now about the routing games is sort of classical or at this point over 10 year old results, so that's less fresh, but it does give you, I think it gives a very nice start of how to, um, help you feel comfortable with the equilibrium concept. What I most recently have been working on, and that was the other word in the title, is auctions or things for selling things, online markets, and I mostly think of markets such as the market that sells ads on any web page you might want to read. So if you choose to read New York Times on, on the web, then uh, maybe you, feel you have a subscription. But what really pays for the service is those little ads in the boxes and the action they use to sell those ads, or the action that sells Google sells next to the search. Also, again, that's really a free service, so it's, sold, it's paid by, by the ox, and they're using auctions to sell it, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how that works and how we're thinking about it. And I guess the high-level point at this point that ratting is a game, the auction thing is a game. And I want to think of the same way of how you're solving this game, or what does it mean to have a recent solution of the game. And then after I introduced the auction framework, um, what came naturally in a routing example, somehow assuming that traffic is at an equilibrium, after all, if you drive in a busy city, you will learn how the best way to drive. Um, this may or may not be fully true on, on on car traffic, it's definitely not really true. On internet traffic, it's not sufficiently stable. And it's absolutely not true in auctions. Things change all the time. So now I want to wonder whether anything I told you about what happens at the Nash equilibrium at the so-called outcome of a game, that's not really expected to happen because we're not expected to get stable outcomes. And that's the last part of the talk when I'm going to try to talk about learning, that is, uh, say how, ask how robust these results are and whether the solution really has to be stable before I can say anything reasonable about it. So that's sort of the three parts of what I'm trying to tell you about. So let me start with a little bit with the traffic routing again in a part that that's the easiest or more natural concept where uh, it's nice to connect people to Nash equilibrium. Um, this is a topic that's at this point 10 or so years old, so some of you, many of you might have heard me or others talk about it. I apologize, I think it's a nice way to introduce the topic. So the example here is a tra congestion based traffic routing. So remember congestion was that if there are more people on the pass, it's slower to get across. To turn this into maths, I have to give you functions. You have to say how much slower. So in this example here, I said that the lower pass there's no congestion effect. It takes one unit of time to get across, but the upper pass has a congestion effect. If there are X units of cars, and you should think of these cars as a, for now, a continuous thing. Remember, I want to connect it to convex optimization. So I think of cars as very, very small. It's one unit of cars, a million cars or something, a continuous uh, quantity. Um, if X units of cars are going on the upper pass, it takes you X 
amount of time to get across. So with the total of one unit of cars, which is in my example, that's what we have, um, you could do what I just did, half the, send half the cars this way and half the cars that way, but if you do that, then the people going in the cars on the one unit long pass are not going to feel very good about this because they see their fellow mates using a much shorter pass and would say, oh, me too. I also want the shorter pass. If they all do that, this is what I'm going to call an equilibrium or, MV free, equilibrium or an MV-free solution. No one wants to switch their pass to something else. Indeed, it's the case that no one can be envious. The bad news is that by now X went up to one and everyone's spending one unit of time uh, getting across. So what happened here is in order to reach an equilibrium, no one got better off. It's just that they're not envious. This is what we call an equilibrium outcome. And I instantly gave you an example to show that, of course, selfish behavior hurts. What really happened here that these people in the lower pass, if you think of them switching sort of one at a time, or in a continuous word, infinitely small amount at a time, they all actually want to switch. The first one looks like they want to switch very badly. It goes from one unit to half. Later on, it's one unit to you know, one minus epsilon by the time this upper pass is very full or one minus teeny weeny. If anyone's going on a lower pass, those guys are envious because at that point, an epsilon amount is going in lower pass, so the upper pass is only one minus epsilon, shorter. This is the unique equilibrium. It's not optimal. And again, what happens, they're all helping themselves, possibly a lot, while hurting everyone else a little bit. The cumulative effect is they didn't actually help themselves and they hurt everyone else. Um, and I guess as an assumption, and this is true at the talk, I'm not talking about malicious people They want to hurt other people's outcomes. These are just people who are selfish. I usually tell you what the objective function is. In the um, auction case, you usually want to make money. In the selfish routing case, you want to get there as fast as possible. So a very natural objective function, and they're just optimizing that objective function. Intuitively, if you don't think about the game theoretic aspect, you would think that these are good objective functions. If people optimize their own objective function, that optimizes a collective welfare. After all, we want to get people there as fast as possible. But as I'm optimizing my welfare, I'm a little bit hurting other people. And as, as it turns out, um, doesn't optimize social welfare. My favorite example that I didn't uh, couldn't give a talk, at least a talk in which I talk about writing at all and not use that sold me on working on game theory is, some, is something called the Brace Paradox. Um, Brace is a German mathematician and discovered this um, in the early 1960s. Um, so this is the same example with X and 1 as the delays, uh, except here there's a very natural Nash equilibrium. It's actually socially optimal going have the, uh, so every most of the pass has one fixed one unit cost pass and one of these varying linear X uh, delay cost pass. If they split the traffic half half, the total is you know, half unit of traffic on each side for a total delay of one plus a half, one and a half. And where the, where the paradox comes, or what's called the paradox, is you put in this extra edge, this center edge, and you wonder what happens. As it turns out, the social optimum didn't change. They're supposed to have stayed on this. I won't convince you of this right this very second, but that's a fact. But what they would do selfishly, it's very tempting not to, to do anything different, and I guess I can't point with this, but this is what they're gonna do. So let me put back the optimum. You have another pass that instead of using x and one, uses x plus zero plus x. Remember, x is only a half. x plus x is one. That's really tempting. And if they all do that, then they get to this version where they all use the x and x, but now there's one unit of traffic on the x, so x, one plus one is two. So now, not only no one is better off, everyone is strictly worse off. Every single human would be better off if they, stricted, if they went to the social optimum. Instead, what they do selfishly is bad for everyone. Um, Again, this is the unique equilibrium. If anyone else is doing something else, then that person can improve his or her own outcome by switching to this solution. Um, it's okay. Um, so this is a pretty painful example for you know, what you might want to do here. 
in one sense, but I guess because I am uh, got sold on the, 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 the thinking of the theoretical computer scientist, or because my dominant example was the internet and not traffic driving, though that's an interesting example too, I can also think of, this isn't so bad. So instead of one and a half seconds, it's going to take you two seconds to download something. Not a big deal. I know, if it's instead of one and a half hours, you're going to take two hours to drive, that does sound pretty painful. But the same difference in sort of terms of seconds, especially if you think about the fact that this model I set up here with the delay function, even whether it's regular traffic or internet traffic, it's a model, it's a mathematical model, it's not quite reality. So do we care about this sort of little bit of delay? So the question is, how bad is this? And I'm going to declare this not so bad. The deterioration is only a factor of like four thirds. And what I call bad is what happened in the tragedy of the commons when there is a good welfare to be had if people only restrain themselves and instead they're having nothing. So the ratio between good and bad, it deteriorates with say the size of the town. If the end people, it goes up to a factor of n verse. Whereas uh, here it was, you know, it was, an unlimited number of cars, and, and nonetheless, it only went, went down a factor of uh, four thirds. So, um, to be formal here, I guess in every uh, game, I have to tell you what, I'm, what do I mean by the individual objective function. An individual player's objective function in this case was to minimize delay. So, in this particular case, these people added up the delay across the edge edges that they're driving on, that was the total delay, and the goal was to minimize that. In every game, I will have to tell you what the goal was. Um, for social welfare, that is how I measure the overall happiness, I'm going to insist on a single method to do this. I simply add up the player's happinesses. That seems like a fair thing. If everyone's optimizing something, and then I globally think of the right thing to think about is the sum of all those optimizations, it does seem reasonable that they're sort of doing the right thing, as it turns out, not always, but that is reasonable. That's called social welfare in, in economic theory, and that's what I'm going to use, because this was a continuous problem. What I have to do is have a notation that says some, say, FP amount of traffic went on pass P, then I take the delay that happened on pass P and multiply it and sum it up all the possible paths. That's the tall, tall delay across all the players. Um, and I guess I wanted to define what Nash equilibrium was, and I sort of defined it informally in the two-line example. Nash equilibrium is an outcome of this, which is I give everyone a pass to choose, and then I evaluate the delays, and it should be the situation that everyone is happy with their choice. Now, happy, what does it mean? Happy in, in, to the extent they have power to change things. That is, everyone, if they get to change the single, singly get to change the outcome, they don't want to change it. Okay, so no cooperation. I can't tell them that, hey guys, we would all be better off if we did something else. That's not part of the Nash kind of thinking. You should think of what you can do sitting in your car driving. If you can go on another route and it will be faster, it's not that Nash equilibrium. If you cannot do that, that's Nash equilibrium. Calling up your friends and telling him how to drive, not an option. Okay, especially since there are infinite number of players here, so you have to call up infinite number of people to do this. But good news about Nash equilibrium is that it exists. This is something Nash proved, and that's, hence it's called Nash equilibrium. I'm a slightly cheating here, and I guess I will stop cheating later on. Uh, it's sort of easier to think about what's called uh, deterministic strategies, everyone choosing one pass. When Nash proved that Nash equilibrium exists, he had, he had to use randomized strategies. So in order for the equilibrium to exist, you have to tell you that with 50-50 probability, you should choose this pass or that pass and flip a coin in the morning and then in expectation you can do better than this. This is the, the way he proved Nash, Nash equilibrium exists. In many of the examples I use, there will be deterministic Nash equilibria, especially in the writing game. Beckman in 56 proved that the writing game has an equilibrium. Uh, in fact, I'm going to prove this to you in a second. Um, um, what is he assuming? Assuming something very natural, that the delay, func delay functions are continuous and increase is increasing. Uh, that is more traffic worse for you. That's natural in the example. 
Um, what we proved, and again, I will try to give you hints of how we did this, but not spend the talk on this, is that indeed for linear delay functions so of the form AX plus B, this four thirds that we've seen actually twice, both in a brace paradox, and as it turns out, also in the single example, also had a four thirds deterioration uh, when everyone switched to the pass X, is indeed the worst possible and linear objective function. Um, this sounds kind of nice, but linear objective functions are not modeling virtually anything. Like in traffic routing, you want to think that passes a capacity. If you reach or approach the capacity, traffic basically holds, gets to a halt. Linear objective functions don't model this. But very much more generally, we also proved that for any continuous non-decreasing latency function, so the kind of things that, that the Beckman uh, result holds about the existence, you can mitigate the effect of selfishness by increasing capacity. And more generally, I phrased it as that the selfish outcome or the Nash equilibrium with traffic rates RI is no worse than the socially optimum design if you had doubled the traffic rate. I like to think about this with a particular delay function, which I wrote down there, uh, one minus u minus, one over u minus x. This is a way to model capacities here. Uh, if u is the capacity, this is a continuous increasing function that indeed goes up to infinity when you approach u. Um, this is a standard uh, continuous model of a mm1 delay queuing functions. And with this, this you, I can replace the double the capacity, replace the statement that the Nash with capacity, two, twice the capacity, is no better than the optimum with capacity U, which I kind of like to think of as saying that if you get to choose between trying to direct traffic versus uh, just building bigger roads, build bigger roads. That's a better idea. And certainly that's a philosophy that the internet very much believes in. Um, I promise you a connection to convex optimization, and I do that in one more slide before I, or two more slides before I switch to auctions. Um, here's what I need to use from convex optimization. So remember social welfare was that we add up the amount of traffic on the pass and the delays of the pass, and there are some constraints that I didn't write out because I won't focus on them, but something of the form that the flow goes from the right place to the right place, that is, as a source and a sink, or different people have different sources and sinks. This you can write out as a convex uh, constraints. The observation to make is that the objective function I can switch, instead of saying that I sum for pass and delays on pass, I can switch to think about uh, oh, sorry. Uh, summing over edges. Every edge, if there's some Fe amount of people on the edge and there is some Le amount of delay on the edge, then these Fe people will su suffer Le amount of delay uh, while they're driving on the edge. So this alternate objective function, which unfortunately, oh, that is the one written on my slide, Le times Fe times the delay on the edge, is a friendlier one because it's a separable objective function, very, very convenient and useful in convex optimization. Every edge has its own objective function. What's nice here because of this kind of objective functions that we have a very nice uh, karush contacker optimality condition. What we want in the op optimality condition is because assuming this is a convex objective function is that all flow travels along minimal gradient plus. Namely, if the gradient on two different passes has different, then you can take a little bit of flow and move it over to the other, other part. Now, what's the gradient of my objective function? The objective function was amount of traffic on the edge times delay on the edge. So using the more convenient x notation for the variable, x amount of traffic times L of x amount of delay, its derivative is this L of x times plus x times the derivative of L. This is just using the chain rule. Um, actually, the product rule, not the chain rule, sorry. Uh, and, but actually, a better way to think of this, read off what you, read, what you get here. So one term of the objective function, the first, is the delay. We knew that. That's what Nash people want to optimize. That's the selfish part. But the second term of the objective function, x times the derivative, what's that? x amount of traffic will suffer, suffer this amount of extra delay because of you, the pain you cause to others. 
Selfish people don't take into account the pain they cause to others. I already gave you this in the other examples, and here it is in terms of maths. In math, social optimization will use the very same objective function. So uh, minimum, the Nash is a, everyone drives on minimum delay pass. At social optimum, they should drive on minimum gradient pass. And the difference is that socially aware people are aware of how much pain they cause to others, which is the second term here. The selfish people ignored it. Uh, the high level point here is that these two objective functions, or th these two conditions are incredibly similar. And this is what we certainly heavily use in the proof, uh, which I won't get to. But so corollary one, that the Nash and the optimum really differed by this, 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 this uh, change. That is, for example, minimum cost is Nash if I only change the delay to this. So for example, I can introduce the extra term as a tax. And now selfish behavior cause, cause optimal behavior. Uh, or backwards, minimum cost is a Nash with a funny kind of objective function. And I guess I maybe should tell you what this funny kind of objective function. I, I took the integral of the um, delay um, so that the derivative becomes what Nash wants to minimize. Nash is an optimization problem. The second point is exactly what Beckman used. Nash is an optimization with a slightly weird looking objective function. None of the less with a monotone, monotone increasing L, that integral is a convex function, so therefore uh, it's a convex optimization problem, and therefore the optimum exists and it actually it's unique, it's strictly convex. Okay, so I'm going to stop here, and this was in part I wanted to get you more comfortable of Nash and get you to think of Nash as a variation on convex optimization, effectively where people ignoring the term that has to do with pain cost to others, which would be part of social optimization. Um, and one who sp spends the remaining half of my time, or however many minutes, in actually something that I've been doing more recently, thinking about online markets and auctions. So there are a lot of different online efforts that you can sell online. You can actually buy anything online, including regular items, like you go, go to a store or, or uh, um, buy stuff on eBay. I'm actually more thinking of items that somehow um, you, you buy and sell over and over. Maybe my prime example in the first slide is advertisement slot, and remember, whether we like or not like advertisement, we live off of it. That is, everything on the internet is paid by advertisement, so it's actually important. Uh, an interesting example I'm going to maybe get to is efforts. That is, when you try to get people to do work, there is some things like Amazon Mechanical Turk, where you can post work and people can do work for you, or Topcoder is, a, is an online system where you can ask people to code stuff for you and they might be willing to code it for you. Um, and I'm going to ask the very same questions I asked in, in uh, traffic routing is how good is the resulting solution? So let me actually do, a, again, one second or maybe one slide, uh, auction 101. The basic things one usually starts with talking about auctions. The, very, the, the famous and maybe most classical or most well-known uh, auction format is what's called the second price. Here we are auctioning off this apple, and these people apparently have uh, values uh, for the apple. Um, the middle guy values the apple at five pesos. Um, the others value for some other number. And the second price auction will tell you that you, choose, you should ask them for their values, which I'll tell you in a second. They will actually be inclined to tell you for real. Um, give, the, uh, give the item to the highest bidder, uh, but only charge him the second highest price. Now, in all of this, what's coming in the next half an hour, I'm going to assume that you have a value for the apple. You actually have to pay a price for the apple, and your net value is uh, V, so value VI minus price PI. Your net, net income is VI minus PI. This might be silly in an apple case because the apple you want to eat, and this is intangible what your benefit really is. But in case of advertisement, this is a very good model. You're only advertising to make money. You expect to make VI amount of money when you advertise. You have to pay PI for it, then for it, then you left VI minus PI. That's how much you're left with. So in advertisement, there's no intangible thing. This is all for money. And so subtracting money from other money makes sense. So this is your net income or net value for the Apple in this case and generally for 
more for advertisement. The second price auction is it does everything you want to know. And I guess my basic message is going to be that this everything we can't have. We can have parts of it, and we can think about which parts we want, want most. So of the three big things that it has, it's truthful. If you think about it for a second, if you're one of these persons de desiring an apple, you're, you, it's in your best interest to actually tell how much you value the apple. The good news is that if you valued it at seven and the next highest value is five, you don't actually have to pay seven, you only have to pay five. That's why it doesn't hurt you to admit your value was seven. And if you cheat well enough to go under seven, then you don't get the apple, now that's even worse. So your best bet is to actually tell your price. That's what truthful is. Efficient means it's socially optimal. Now, socially optimal is a bit painful here because it will be good for some and not for the others. But if you don't think of apples, but instead think of some goods, so for example, a lot of government properties sold in this kind of auction, then the government's goal in selling, say, spectrum, which is one thing they sell, is to have the spectrum well used. They want to give it to the person who thinks its value, whose, whose value for it is highest, who's the best to take advantage of the spectrum they got. Uh, so they gave the apple vent to the person who valued it highest. And simple, the whole thing was pretty simple. They named the number, you chose the highest number, simple. Uh, simple, I don't have a definition for. It does seem simple. Uh, other auctions that are commonly used. So for advertisement, there are a couple of variations of first and second price. So first price would be the same thing. It actually loses the truthful, truthfulness and make you pay what you say. You say it, you value it seven, I give it to you, seven. You just said it's seven. So I, I, I leave it to you of exactly what you want to name there. Your value is probably not it. Because at that point, your net benefit for getting it is zero. That's not a good idea. You should shade your value a bit. So that's not truthful, but definitely simple. It's also a good, simple action for my, there's generalization of this, generalized first and generalized second price used at some other auctions. I won't get into this. If I think about effort, that gives me another interesting auction example, and I thought I at least mentioned that one. It's called OPE. It's a funny kind of auction in which putting it in an auction framework, it will tell you to, you all tell me how much you want to pay. I collect all the money from all of you. And the guy who said the highest amount, he actually gets the, gets the, gets the unit, and the rest of you get absolutely nothing. You might think it is funny, and I'm not surprised to hear some giggles around here, but actually effort is often sold this, often, often auctioned this way. So for example, you can run a competition for uh, who will design the uh, logo for the Mets Congress of the Americas. Um, and you say, okay, the person whose logo is the most beautiful or the one we choose is going to get 100 US dollars as a reward and his, his logo will be used and the rest of you, mm, too bad. This is an all-pay auction. Everyone who's submitting something worked and that work had some cost to them and we didn't get any payment. The highest payer got $100, that was the price. Okay, so that's exactly an all-pay auction. There are many other all-pay auctions in word usually think of as contests. Uh, War of attrition is a variation on this, which maybe I'll skip due to lack of the time. Most of these are not truthful except for the second price, but they definitely are pretty simple and they're commonly used. So uh, now I have a divide here and classical action theory, oh sorry, backwards. Classic and actual action theory doesn't value simple very much in particular because I couldn't define it and values truthful a lot. And in fact, there is a general uh, mechanism called Vickery Glass, Glass, Clark Groves or VCG that's truthful. Uh, it does do the optimal thing. It's not simple and I'm going to not, uh, not elaborate on it beyond uh, one point here. Uh, actually two points. One is that not simple. I'm going to use instead this very simple, very uh, intuitive schemes such as first price, second price, something very simple, which is not truthful, but it's, you, it's commonly used and very simple. And the second version is more like a game. The first version, you have, everyone tells the truth, you do it optimally, it's a design question. The second version is more like a game, and I'm going to think of the game version and evaluate the game version. Um, one important reason the game version, I think, is a better way to think about auctions is because most people participating in this don't participate in a unique auction, and that maybe is the key point, more important, or at least as important as simplicity. So if you think I'll put up a lot of auctions, and in this slide I have 
ooh, like 15, 20 of them, because each box has multiple ways you can do that kind of thing. So there are goods we can buy on eBay or someplace else. Uh, there's information you can buy, ads you can buy, uh, sell all kinds of places, efforts, all kinds of different places. And there's one person that participates in all of this. And you know, this was actually, you don't have to go online to think about this. You can simply think of your effort to buy a house. That's an auction, it's usually sold on first price. You name the price, the, the owner either takes it or not. That's called first price. Um, but there are multiple houses. It isn't that there's a house to tell you value, they sell it maybe on the second price that would be better. Um, life is more complicated than that. If you don't buy the house you meant to buy today, there's another house tomorrow. Or maybe there's another house you could have done a, a bid right then simultaneously. So what I mean by composition is that one person, this little boy in my picture, might participate in multiple things. And I guess houses are usually the most intuitive and simplest example, but this happens everywhere. You don't have to buy houses for this. What happens in auction in a house is suppose he has to he has to two houses and he has to put in a bid for each of the houses and uh, telling both house owners what he truthfully values the house is probably a pretty horrible idea. Like for one week he can win both houses. He has no use for two houses, but they cost twice as much money. Uh, so maybe what people actually do is do sequentially first bid on one house and then the other. But if you do that, it's also not a good idea to tell the first house owner how much you value the house for real. Like you actually think maybe you can get the second house at a lot cheaper price. If so, you know, there's a trade-off here. And it's not, this truthfulness is only good in single shot examples. So when the government, US government sells spectrum, it's a good idea because you can think of spectrum selling spectrum as a pretty unique event. It doesn't happen very often, every 10 years, every 20, I don't know, very, very rarely. In contrast, advertisement you sell every second. So that's not a unique event. If you didn't get this spot, there's a spot a second from now, almost equally good for you, maybe not quite. So the, the, a different sort of framework, and with this framework, I think it's better to think of it as a game and not the, not the single shot truthful thing. So uh, the rest of the talk is coming from a recent paper with my student, uh, Vasily Sirkanis, uh, and our goal is to try to understand what mechanisms or what selling mechanisms have the property that they're efficient, uh, even if composed with, mu with multiple copies of different things running at different times. So the main theme is that I want to have one, some way of thinking of what's locally efficient, that is generates good, at, there's no tragedy of the commons, that is generates good outcome locally, should automatically imply that if people participate in most, more, more of these, then it's globally also efficient. Um, because I don't want to get into too many details of what exactly we may name by mechanism, I'm going to, for this talk, restrict myself of selling items. And I guess you can refer your paper to what is the more general framework. Selling items, again, mostly will be ads, of course. So this is a new picture of the New York Times with circling the ad slots where they sold something. Um, but maybe for the picture, I'm going to think of uh, different fruits is what you're selling. There will be players, each player will be interested in multiple, in possible one or two, one or many, many of the items I'm selling. Its valuation is not additive in the items. After a while, you extra ads don't, don't do, do anything for you. You want to get, the audience is saturated with ads at some point. And you might have different values for different items. This is true even going back to the ad slots. Different advertisers view these slots differently. They might think that the top ones are only valuable, or they might think that the dumb one also, the, the lower one is also valuable. Some people like the New York Times, advertising the New York Times, other people only like advertising in Google. Different advertisers have different, very intuitive rules, or intuitive to them sometimes rules, of what is a good way, good way to sell ads. And the key idea that I'm going to exploit is most auction formats give you prices. First price, second price, all pay. There was a price that the winner paid for this. And I'm going to think of that's the price of the item. There's an implicit price defined here, the price the winner paid for the item. Um, and I'm going to think about what are the auction formats that generate good prices and what are the auction formats that are dangerous for this and might generate bad prices. So let me start with what, what do I think of, what do I mean by good prices? 
So prices are just good. Prices are what, if you took Econ 101, they usually start with pricing is good for the economy. Uh, and what they mean is this very busy concept called market clearing prices. So market clearing prices, and maybe you shouldn't even look at my slide for a sec, is the kind of thing you think when you go into the store. There are prices posted on the items on the store, and you just grab what you want and go home and you're happy. And this works well if it's never the case that you look at the prices and see an empty shelf, or alternately, end of the day, the store owner discovers the rotten milk that no one bought because the price was too high. If none of these two sell them, then, the, then we say that the market cleared. And that's what I'm defining here. The market cleared is that I, I got people to take the items they wanted, the one on which the utility was as good as any other utility they could have had. Now remember I have this, what's called quasi-linear utility. They have a value for the set of items, which could be arbitrary, but then they subtract the price because this is all about money. So if they had to pay for it, they subtract the price. Um, something is market clearing, then I claim that it generates a socially optimal outcome, and this is a really, really easy and intuitive proof, so maybe I, I have it on, summarized on this slide. If, if prices are market clearing, everyone got their optimal item, so optimal set of items. So every, every person, if I take his value minus what he paid, it's better than any other set of items minus what he had to pay for that. That's why he took this set of items. I take these inequalities and sum them up over all the players. And then I know this because the market cleared, that is all the items got so nothing got rotten, and no one went home not being able to take his item, the prices fell out. Everything sold. Both, both sides have all the prices. So what I get is that the allocation, the sum of the values is, is better than any other allocation that you could have. So this is that markets and prices are good, now the question is, what actions generate good prices and what actions generate bad prices? And do actions generate prices in this way at all? So the first observation is that first price auction actually seems sort of good. Um, so here's how it's good. When you do a first price auction, they're the players, they got some things, in this case I, my items turn into cameras for some reason. And I claim that if first price auction is pre, so it defines the price, this is the price the item sold. If I focus on a person and, and he says, no, 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 I'm unhappy with my outcome, I would have wanted this other set of items, I wanted to those two cameras instead. In a first price auction, he can change his bid, and remember this is an equilibrium kind of analysis, so I want to think of what he could have done to change, change his outcome. He could only bid a little bit above what this guy's bid, and he would have gotten it. First price, you just epsilon outbid the other guys, you win. Um, so, in an, in an, so in particular, in Nash equilibrium, or a full information Nash equilibrium, generates uh, socially optimal or market clearing prices and hence uh, socially optimum prices. This is only true in a full, inf in a what's called pure or pure strategy Nash equilibrium because this poor person here named I has to know what to bid. If anything is random, the price varies and you don't know what to bid. But if it's a full information, that if it's a, a pure strategy solution, everyone's bidding fixed things, then um, this happens. But Pure strategy equilibria in first price auction, they virtually never exist. So maybe that's not working so well. Okay, remember Nash exists, but that has to, you have to randomize. And here I need a full information. But this is where I got the idea from, and this is the main concept which I want to get across in, in, uh, for auctions. I will care an auction that generates okay prices smooth, and here is what smooth will mean. So an auction generates okay prices, if the same sort of inequality holds, except I put in two, um, what's called maybe fudge factors. So instead of asking you to be able to get any set of items at the current prices, I'm asking you to get, be able to get with an alternate bid. I'm asking you to get some other set of items, maybe not quite as good, lambda can be say a half. You don't have to get the full value, only half the value. And maybe not that the prices may be a little bit up from the prices. So remember, I come from the computer science upbringing where a factor of two loss is not a big deal. So I put in these fudge factors because I don't that much care whether you get the true optimum or a little bit off from the optimum. 
And lambda and mu are things I'm allowing you to be off from the optimum. If I make everyone pay twice as high, I lost a factor of two. If I make everyone only get half the value again, I lost another factor of two. Um, or maybe even better, I don't even have to have everyone reach this, though maybe that's the simplest. I just want it to happen in, in, uh, in aggregate. And then we naturally have that this smooth mechanism gets a socially approximately optimal outcome where this very same proof you have seen in Nash equilibrium, I'm losing the lambda and mu in the same proof because I put in these factors. The key thing I want to add, and this is going to be what makes everything work much better, is that I want your action, the one that guarantees you the better outcome in this, this somewhat good outcome, to not depend what other people do. So switching back to the slide, here the key problem was in this very simple and elegant proof that first price auction is good, that was only good in full, in full information. You had to know what the prices were. In particular, you had to know what everyone else did. What price did someone took home this item and then you're envious that, hey, he got to take it home for a dollar. For a dollar, I would have preferred to have that guy. But if they randomize or if it's not, a, not all information, then you don't need this. So I want to ask you to be able to do this uh, without, without knowing what everyone else does. It does look like a bit of a magic. But if you do have this, so an, an auction is, is smooth, then not only you have a price of energy that's at least mu over lambda, at most mu over lambda, but this preserved in composition, um, as under some assumption I'll define in a second. It's true on randomized outcome, it's true on, on, on learning outcomes, and true on all kinds of, it's very robust. It remains true all the time, and I'll come convince you of this in a second. Before I do that, um, I want to give you an example of what do, how is it possible for someone to have a magic bid that generates some sort of good outcome for him without knowing what everyone else did? And it turns out it's not as hard as one think. So think of, my prime example is a single item auction, and I guess it's first price again. And I claim it's what's called one half, one smooth. So, um, and I claim what you should do in a one half, one smooth argument is bid half your value, exactly half. Now why is that? If you're bidding your half your value, then what I need to prove that this particular bid, no matter what everyone else did, generates utility, which is greater than half your value minus the price. Remember, those were the two fudge factors, half and one in this case. And I claim it does that, because either with half your value you win, and since you bid half your value, you couldn't have possibly paid more than half your price, so half of it is left in utility, so you have the inequality easily. Or second, you lost. But if you lost, your price was half your value, so the right, the right hand side of the inequality is half your value minus half your value is zero. So the inequality says nothing. Now what's important here, I didn't ask you to bid this. I didn't go to people to say that, hey, I have a cool bid for you, bid half your value. I'm just going to assume you're doing better than this. There is something you could do. You could do it easily that generates this. You should do better than that. You're doing your best bid. Your best bid is better than this thing. This is all I'm going to use. I'm not asking people to do it. In fact, I'm asking them to do better than this. And that's my only assumption here. So there are many other actions, and they all have the, the many or most of them have this sort of uh, uh, bits and usually of the form that you're shading your value and usually not by a factor of two. It wasn't actually optimal to shade it by a factor of two here either. It was just simple. Uh, you should do something. Uh, optimize the constant. Um, so um, as a corollary, we get that, that the simultaneous auctions, if you sell a lot of things uh, across different markets in first price, in second price, in all pay, in war of attrition, in any of those things going on simultaneously, uh, at any Nash equilibrium, um, the price of energy is at most a factor of two. Two is what half over one, like one over a half is what the two was. Two is the band we got from the two numbers we had before. Um, I owe you two things. Uh, first of all, I owe you a definition of no complements, which I'm going to maybe uh, be a bit skimpy on because uh, maybe I don't have quite enough time. 
to make you an intuitive sense of what no complements was, it's probably better to start with an example of what I mean by complements. So complements, this complements is when the left shoe is sold in a different market than right shoe. Your value for the left shoe is literally nothing till you get the right shoe. That's no good. What I mean by no complement, what I mostly will mean by no complement is this inequality, the submodular inequality, and there are more relaxed definitions which I'm going to skip. Submodular inequality means that if you already get, if I give you, like, if I value this value for this click, I click, this clicker here, and as I give you more and more stuff, your value for this goes down and not up. This is what happened wrong with the shoe. The left shoe has the property that when I hand you a right shoe, your value of, for the left shoe went up. Okay, so I want your value for an item to continuously go down as you give you more things. That's my assumption of no complement. Um, there are more general assumptions that I'm skipping. Um, and I guess the main theorem here is that if something has this smooth property and the, the players have no complements or maybe something more general than some modular, then the composition also remains smooth. And um, um, hmm, maybe a best use of time, I'm going to skip this proof, I'm sorry. Um, and then maybe finally, something that I think I like and that's why I skipped the previous proof, um, but I promised you in the beginning, uh, learning outcomes. So you should ask yourself in an auction setup or in actually any writing setup where life isn't stable. So internet is certainly one of those, adverts, Things happen in the world that changes which adverts are useful. It changes what searches we, we issue in Google, and as a result, it changes what adverts are useful to, to what, what, what uh, adds a verse how much. Um, so Nash equilibrium might not be, or stableness might not be a reasonable concept. There's a second problem with Nash equilibrium. They're, they're, they're computationally hard to find, um, and that's a result somewhat recent result by Daskalakis, Gosberg, and Papa Dimitriou. And if they're computationally hard to find, then why did I assume these players found it? That doesn't seem very reasonable. So I want to actually claim that one important thing of anything we have done is that it not only applies in Nash equilibrium, but it applies in no-regret learning. And I virtually proved this to you. I just forgot to define no-regret learning, which is why I'm going to spend the last five minutes for this. So I don't need to do any more proof. I need to give you what the definition is and point out that the proof I did was good for this. So what's no regret learning? Um, no regret learning is an outcome, is a, is a concept about multiple periods of time and actually ideal for auctions. So there is auctions going on, maybe time is slotted at minute one and minute two, and you do something and bid, and as time goes on you learn. And maybe in the beginning you don't quite know what you're doing, and maybe at the end you're a little bit smarter. The standard I'm hoping you to, to, to have is the one that's written on the bottom of this slide. That is, you're bidding all kinds of things and you're varying your bid and you discover that you know, the value of something is changing and maybe you should bid something different. What I would like you to be able to do, if there's a single very good bid with hindsight, you should have discovered this. So if it turns out that bidding half your value is in fact a very good thing, you experiment, you bid all your value, two thirds, one third, half, and you realize that hey, half is consistently very good. You should discover this. Uh, this is not, this is a natural assumption. If things stabilize, this is exactly what happened. Uh, you have a bid that you're happy with, nothing else is better. Uh, but what's nice about this, that it's very doable, that it's very simple and very intuitive algorithms give you this kind of no regret. So this is not a very high standard. You could do better than this. It could be that bidding at 8 a.m. is, you know, you should bid high and then, then at 9 p.m. you should bid low. I'm not asking you to discover that fact. I'm only asking you to discover a very simple fact. If there's a single bid that's consistently good across the period, please notice this fact. Do at least as well as that single bid. And what's nice here, that it, I think it's an intuitive, reasonable thing, and also there are multiple very nice algorithms, very simple, nice algorithms uh, that take care of this. And the point I want to emphasize, or want to point out as the last point of my talk, that the proofs I tried to show you were exactly 
proofs against no regret, not against Nash equilibrium. The only thing I used against in the proof, I use in the proof, is that you don't regret certain things. In particular, don't regret bidding half, not bidding half your value. I'm not asking you to bid half your value. I'm just asking you not to regret it. Please don't regret not doing that. Do something better than this. That was the main proof when we add, uh, add, add things. And in particular, it's sort of as a reminder. So the, in the sequence, there are multiple bits. Um, but uh, you t what this no regret bond tells you that for every player, uh, if I add up its utility it got from all the bits it did during the time against a single bit with hindsight, he should not regret it. This is the no regret band. And just like before, I add up the no regret bands across all the players and then use the smoothness inequality, I guess actually use the smoothness inequality for every single time step and, and adding up all the players and I get exactly the one I wanted. So I didn't use that they're at Nash, but I used that they have no regret. That's the part of Nash I used. And what's nice this, that this part actually is algorithmically very achievable and very natural to ask people or assume that the regular players, uh, most players in an auction game and event are using this, usually optimizing agents or help, have someone helps them bid, and this is exactly what they're aiming for. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. So the main theorem that uh, I spent the second half of the talk on is trying to define a format of the auction game as smooth. Smooth meant that it approximately generates market clearing prices. Uh, approximately here meant that you get not quite as good as what, whatever you want, like half that value and not quite at the price that they paid for it, but maybe twice as much but approximately similar to market clearing prices. And that this notion of approximately market uh, mechanisms that generate this approximately market clearing prices is very robust. It works well in composition. If two mechanisms do this, then they do it together. Also, um, it generates price of energy bands on equilibria, but not only on equilibria, but all learning outcomes. And in fact, it's even true in one version I didn't tell you about, there could be uncertainty about who you're playing against that these multiple periods, the opponents might change, and that's okay also. It's very robust in any of these setups. Um, to summarize what I'm hoping to have told you in two different contexts, um, first of all, to start with, uh, selfishness or selfish behavior inadvertently can ruin social welfare. The tragedy of the commons is a very common example. And despite that I spend the whole talk on things where tragedies don't happen because that's what makes an interesting talks, uh, there are tons of application around where we're exactly experiencing that, the tragedy of the commons. There are lots of tragedy of the commons. Uh, and what I want to think about, one way I want to think about this, that there are some examples where there are no tragedies, that is the, the deterioration due to selfishness is limited, and ideally we want to design for this, and the auction framework is definitely one, that, a design framework, as if you are selling whatever you're selling online, advertisement or effort or whatnot, uh, or, or buying effort or selling advertisement, uh, in each of these, these are designed mechanisms, and. I'm suggesting that this particular smoothness is a nice framework to design mechanisms in because it has this robustness that avoids the, the tragedy of the commons or the bad deterioration of the tragedy of the commons. And then finally, it's important to have these guarantees, whether it's via smoothness or via some other method, to be robust because assuming that many, many players, especially in a large game with a large number of players, reaching an Nash equilibrium is an unreasonable, assum unreasonable assumption for many, many respects, for computationally hard, uh, socially hard to arrange, and many other things. So it's much, much better if, the, if the, whatever bounds you're proving is robust in the sense that it makes a weaker assumption, for example, learning. So thank you very much. Like how, like for example, uh, uh, how Amazon or, or 
how New York Times sell advertising spots. What do they use and how, they, how good are they? So it's a great question of what they really use. So there are two issues here. One I slightly swept under the rug, uh, the distinction between first and second price. So in some ways, second price is better because it's truthful and some places use second price or analogs of second price. Um, in this framework, you have to be a little bit careful with the second price. Second price actually has horrible equilibria, even single item second price, truthful or not, single item second price for this little thingy. For some reason, you decide to be the $100 and you, you announce this publicly. I know, it's not worth $100, I know that. But you be the $100. The rest of you hear this and go home with zero. On second price, he gets it for zero, and this is actually an optimal, and doesn't matter who I pointed to and whether that was the highest valued person. So second price, to prove anything good in a game theoretic framework about second price, I have to assume no one's doing that. No one is bidding above their value. Uh, nonetheless, so this suggests that first price would be a better thing to use. It doesn't have this problem. That you can game it. He can game it. He can assume that if he public enough about how high he's bidding, then the rest of you will go home. This is not a problem in first price. Second price has other good things. You can extend this framework to second price if you assume no overbidding, that is, they not bid above their value. <coughs> but I don't, I mean, I think we should do more to understand the trade off between first and second price. Uh, beyond this, what they use is all, uh, all happily within this framework, the all variation on, on things in this framework. Uh, in part because the framework is pretty robust for single item auctions and they're all auctioning everything separate. So there's very few combinatorial auctions out there which is historically advertisement was sent on, sold, sold on packages. That historically you, you contracted the New York Times for you know, 100 shows or even the webs went that way. 100 sh showing your web a million times, that's what they contacted you for. There are less and less of that and more and more of this. So they're switching to sell every ad impression separately. And you can just you know, put in a repeated bid hoping to get a million ad impressions if that's what you want. Uh, but classically, there was a lot of package things, which are harder to analyze and harder to do. Uh, I think things are moving in this direction. Modulo the second price auction. Is there one more question? So do you think that uh, the no equipment assumption is realistic for social behavior, humans that are not good things? Is the question is, is the no regret assumption realistic for, so, for human behavior? I don't know, and I don't know how to experiment with this. Um, I, I actually much more think that it's very realistic on online advertising, advertising because almost all the players in this game are using ad optimizers, that there's this little agents or services that optimize your ad. So they algorithmically optimize their ad, and that is exactly what they're doing. They're avoiding regret. So if you're using an ad, a, a bid optimizer, then I think it's an incredibly good assumption. Uh, whether humans do this, I don't know, but I do know that this is a more general notion than Nash equilibrium. So if something is true for this, it's automatically true for Nash equilibrium. So it's a relaxation of Nash equilibrium. Maybe for humans, it didn't go far enough. But for automated agents, I think it went far enough. So thank you very much.